And this is a long talk, and I have to cover many different topics. So in about 90 minutes, you will get a good idea about the front-end development as it is now. We'll talk about different tools, frameworks, we'll see some sample, code samples, and everything. And uh, let's start. A couple of words about myself. Uh, about myself. I am a co-founder of two companies. One of them is Farata Systems, which is a consulting company. We hire people, mainly full-stack developers, Java, Angular. The other company is a product company. We develop product, which is in production for many years for insurance industry in the United States. And I've written a bunch of books. The first one, I mean, the newest one is this one. It's about TypeScript. It's called TypeScript Quickly. I have a couple of t-shirts, too, actually. Two t-shirts to give away with the cover, with the title of this book. There's a discount code if you want to get it half price. You can get it at Manning. And most of the materials from today's talk are from that book. In that book, I actually I wrote it not myself, with my colleague. His name is Anton. Uh, we first part we describe the TypeScript, and then we show you different use cases how to use it with Angular, with uh, React.js, with Vue.js, and the app that we selected for the book is not trivial. It's about blockchain. So we develop blockchain in different versions, in you know, all these frameworks, and so on. And today, I will show you some samples I'm extract from that book. All code samples are on GitHub, if you don't want to buy a book, which is a mistake. But you can get them for free, of course. I, I've written a bunch of other books in the past, and these are some of them. Up on top in, in Ukrainian, it's a translation to Ukrainian programming for kids. I was pleasantly surprised to see over here at the book stand, there are some books on programming for kids, which is great. So, tooling. This is a Java conference. Am I correct assuming that all of you are Java developers? Is it so? Yes? Yes. So, yes, you can stay a Java developers, developer, but to be really competitive, you have to, have, you have to know many tools. Being just a Java developer is like saying, I can work with Philips screwdriver, and that's all I can do. We don't want to work only with Philips screwdriver. We want to work with different tools. We don't want to fall in love with any tool, being that Java, Kotlin, Scala, whatever. We are professionals, so check is in the mail. They pay us. We will write in COBOL if need be. That's the attitude, my attitude at least. So let's start. TypeScript. TypeScript is a new JavaScript, basically. All Java developers I've seen so far don't like JavaScript. But I've been teaching many classes for Java developers for private client in the US. They all like TypeScript. TypeScript is a language that compiles to JavaScript. None of the browsers can run TypeScript, and there is no plan to do that. So you write in TypeScript, you compile it, or as I say, transpile it from one source code to the other source code into JavaScript and then deployment and everything. Language was designed by the creator of C Sharp, Anders Heilsberg, C Sharp, Turbo, Pascal, Delphi, all that. Uh, and it has great IDE support. So basically, JavaScript plus types. So you, you can declare a variable, and you can specify its type. Something that you take for granted. You think that in Java we declared a variable like this, and we can do it in any language. No. Some people are suffering till now. So TypeScript allows you to declare variables with types, but you don't have to. Optional typing. If you want to have a mix, some variables have types, some don't, it is possible. 
And you, with TypeScript, you can uh, catch errors during compile time. You don't have, have to wait for run, running the program just to see that something is wrong. And if you will check the Stack Overflows uh, developer surveys for, from this year, you will see that the number one language, the most popular language today, is JavaScript. But, but TypeScript is already on the ninth place. So it's already ahead of C Sharp and C and Ruby, so it's moving up pretty fast. And if you will look at this chart, most loved languages, the language that people want to learn, it shares the second and third place with Python, up on top. So let's take a look at Java, as a JavaScript piece of code. I will spend like seven minutes to give you an intro to TypeScript, and then we'll move to use, I mean, to start using this, the language. So this is JavaScript. You declare a variable customer ID, you assign a value to it. JavaScript understands that since you assigned something in double quotes, apparently customer ID is a string. But on the next line, you can say customer ID is equal one, two, three. It's a number. In JavaScript, that's OK. It's a dynamic typing. JavaScript assumes that, all right, so it used to be a string. Now you decided it to be a number. So it will not complain. In TypeScript, it won't work. In TypeScript, the same thing. You declare a variable, and you specify that it's a string. Or you can assign similarly this value in double quotes. In that case, TypeScript would infer that this is a string. Next line, you try to assign one, two, three, you're going to get a compile time error, saying, what are you doing? You said it's a string. What is a workflow? Let's say you learn the language. What do you do to program and to deploy this program, the web app, for example, um, uh, written in TypeScript? You need to turn it into JavaScript. So there is a compiler. The name of the compiler is TSC. You can install it and compile it from the command line. You can use it in your workflow, in your deployment. TypeScript files have extension TS, dot TS. On the left, you see three files, A, B, and C, all with extension dot TS. You can compile them using TSC compiler into three files with extension JS. So now these are JavaScript files. And then you need to bundle them. In the modern development for the front end, nobody would deploy separate files. You may have hundreds of files in your front end. So you bundle them up. You create smaller number of JavaScript files. Say you have 500 files. You will be deploying five or 10. There are different bundlers. One of the most popular ones probably is called Webpack. So people use Webpack to take all the JavaScript files and, and create smaller numbers. Not only JavaScript, uh, CSS, if need be, maybe some HTML, and so on. To install this compiler, right down there you see npm install minus g TypeScript. npm, it's a manager, package manager that is used in the entire JavaScript community. For Java developers, it's like Maven. There is a central repository in JavaScript world. It's called npmjs.org. There is like about a million of packages. And you can run npm install. Minus g means global. And what do you want to install? Now, the good part is that you can use TypeScript, which you write with existing JavaScript libraries. There are thousands of them. And nobody would be using TypeScript if, there wouldn't, if you wouldn't be able to work with existing code. And you can do this easily. So in that case, your workflow would be a little bit different. Once again, so you have TypeScript files over here. You compile them into JavaScript. Also, there are so-called type definition files that allow you to work with JavaScript and still have support on autocomplete, on compile time error, even for the libraries that were written in JavaScript. Type definition is like 
in C.h file, just declaration of the types. So you can take any library you want and bring it into your TypeScript workflow. Then again, bundling and deployment. Let's take a couple of examples. On the left-hand side, you see the code in TypeScript. And on the right, you see the code in JavaScript. By the way, I see that some people are taking photos of the slides. Being a professional speaker, on the first slide, at the bottom, there is a link to this slide deck. So take a photo of this slide and concentrate. Listen to what I have to say. Don't take photos. You can f take a photo of me if you want, but not the slides. All right, so, so in TypeScript, there is a tool called rep. Run, explore, print, something else, I don't remember, evaluate. So you can try a small piece of code. On the left-hand side, you type TypeScript, and immediately you see the JavaScript version of your code. So on the right, you see the compiled version in JavaScript of what you see on the left. So I have a class. You can declare a class. In this case, this class has no constructor. I have first name, last name, age. Types are, de are used on the right, at, not like in Java. In Java, you would say string and the first name. And this, over here, it's different. Then in line number seven, you create a new instance of this class. And then you can assign properties and so on. Next, interfaces. Like in Java, we have interfaces. JavaScript doesn't support interfaces. So when you compile it, when you compile the code that has interfaces, you, it will not generate anything. So interfaces are just your protection during development. But they don't go in production because JavaScript doesn't support them. Now let's take a look at this. Pythagorean theorem, Theorema Pythagora. So let's take a look at this piece of code, which is written in JavaScript. Do you see anything wrong in this code? I, I know that you are not a JavaScript developer, but you, are, you should be able to spot it. What? Oh, you say I forgot the parentheses over here. Yes, sorry, but this is not what I meant. Assume that it's there. Anyone? What? There is nothing to elaborate. There is fine li five lines of code. Something is wrong there. Yep. Exactly. See, you already know JavaScript. Z, look at this Z. There is no Z. We, we assign point X and point uh, and Y, right? No Z. But in JavaScript, you will not see this error until you run this program. So this problem right there. Of course, you're going to run it. You will see an error. It blow up. You will fix it. And this is the process in JavaScript. At the bottom of this slide, there is a link. If I click on it, It'll go to that REPL online. And on the left has side. I can type JavaScript on the right. Sorry, TypeScript on the left, JavaScript on the right. Right now, both are fine because there's no types. We want to make this program more bulletproof. By doing what? Let's define a type. Nothing stops me from declaring a type. Interface point, and I will do x number, and I will do y number. So I defined a custom type, right? And now these are parameters of the function. What I will do, I will say that point A is actually of type point, and point. Look at it down down there. Look at this last line. It's already catch catching the errors right away. Point B, uh, also point. Right? So now you see it. 
Now you need to be that smart as a couple of people in this audience. Now everybody can see that. So if you hover the mouse pointer over, it'll give you detailed description of the error. Argument of type Z number, Y number is not assignable to parameter of time point. Correct, we understand that. IDEs of TypeScript are excellent. They would give you something similar. As you type, help, and the great and great uh, uh, error handling. So to fix it, I will change it to X, and the error will be gone. So see, just a little thing. Moreover, you may be a JavaScript developer, and if you will just add special directive to the top of your existing JavaScript, you will not even be rewriting it in TypeScript. It will point you at the errors, at the bugs, maybe, that you didn't even think exist in your program. OK. So generics. In Java, we have generics. Over here, they also have generics. Let's say we have three classes. Person, employee, that extends person, and animal. It doesn't extend any of these. And if you will declare an array, you can use generic notation like in Java. New person, new employee, and then new animal. TypeScript will give you the error, compile time errors. You understand why, right? Because we said that the array will have only person or its subclasses, but it's not the case. When I try this example, since I know Java, then I, I decided to put a check mark that I already understand generics in TypeScript, which was wrong. Because TypeScript is so-called structural typing language, as opposed to Java, which is so-called nominal typing language, nominal system. Meaning, if I have a class customer or a person, and if I will declare a variable of type person, then I create a new instance only of the class person, or maybe of its subclasses. But in TypeScript, they have a concept of shape. It's kind of similar, this type to that type. So basically, in my example, if I would add the property name to the animal, the error would be gone. So a person has a name, employee has a name, an animal has a name, so it's OK to put an animal in the array. Yes, uh, you will not be able to access breed property from the array, but that's OK. Name is there. All right, I'm not going to go further into detail. It's really interesting, simple to learn, and very powerful language. And it's popular. More and more developers are start using it. New frameworks in JavaScript, new versions of existing frameworks are being written in TypeScript. Angular, the whole thing was written in TypeScript. Or XJS in TypeScript, uh, latest version. Uh, Vue, uh, version 3, is, re is written in TypeScript. So, so TypeScript, you, you know TypeScript by now, so you can update your resume. Now, let's keep going. Keep increasing your marketability. Web framework. Within the next half an hour, you need to learn three frameworks. Three. And we'll do this. Once again, Stack Overflow Developer Survey for 2019. What are the most popular web framework? Well, jQuery is number one because, I mean, 20 years writing in jQuery, who can beat that? So it's still there. It's still like half of the websites are written in, in jQuery. So let's leave it alone. Then what? AngularJS. If you will click on this tab, I clicked on purpose to on professional developers. In all respondents, you would see React second and Angular third. But for enterprise development, Angular is, in my opinion, more practical. Anyway, second place, third place. And Vue.js is written by a guy initially who worked on Angular team, Evan Yu. And now it has like 300 contrib contributors, very popular framework, 150,000 uh, stars on GitHub, and so on. So these are the popular ones. Express, ASP.NET, we ignore. 
Spring is Java, of course, we, we don't ignore, but it's not exactly the best way to write front-end these days. So we'll talk about the three that I highlighted. So Angular is a framework, meaning they tell you how to, uh, how to live in this environment, how to write code. They give you a structure as any framework, and within the structure you write pieces of code here and there. React is just a library. You cannot compare, you cannot say, what is better, Angular or React? Because by React, we understand the library, core React library that is great at rendering UI in, on the web. But typically, the app needs something else. The app needs routing, form support, uh, work with uh, or state management, and so on. React doesn't have all that. You can pick other libraries and use them with React. But React is a library, and Angular is a framework. Vue.js started as a library, but now I can say it's like a library plus plus. They are trying to add features here and there to make it a little bit, a little bit more complete. In, in particular, they added router. So router is a part of uh, Vue now. How do you create a new project? How do you start with any of these frameworks? Any development in the JavaScript world for the front end, it's not only about writing code, being that JavaScript or being that mm, TypeScript. You need to compile, you need to bundle, you need to optimize before you, lo you let the browser read it. And when I say compile, it's applicable not only if you will write in TypeScript. Even if you say, I don't care about TypeScript, I want to write in JavaScript. Fine, but what is JavaScript? Starting from 2015, they started to add more and more new features every year to the JavaScript language. So if you want today use, if you want to use the latest version of JavaScript, you, you still need to compile it down so all older browsers support it. So you can't get away without the compiler anyway. And Babel is a popular one for JavaScript uh, world. After that, you need to compile it and optimize it. I need to maybe to slice it into modules so you can you know, do something like lazy loading and so. So it's, there's a process. Be because there's a process, you need to do configurations. Any projects on the front end will include a bunch of configuration files. Configure TypeScript compiler, configure Bubble, configure Webpack, so something. And initially, when any of these frameworks was developed or offered, it was not easy. People started complaining. It's, I cannot remember all these options and write all these config files. So creators of these libraries said, all right, we're going to give you CLI tools. CLI stands for Command Line Interface. From the command line, you can run a command, and it will generate for you the whole the project with all configuration files that you may need. After that, you will keep adding stuff to this project. So in this case, on this line, if, I, if you install, and I did, of course, on my computer, uh, something called Angular CLI, on the command line, you're going to have this ng command. So in this case, I'm saying ng new, I'm saying generate for me a new project. I want to call it hello world, and I want to, I want it to have minimal configuration. I'm not going to go into details, but it'll generate for you a new project and install a bunch of, develop, of dependencies. Let's try. I don't know how fast internet is over here, but we'll still try that. So I'll open up the command line, ng, ng new. Hello, uh, hello, mm, let's say world, and I will say minimal. In a second, it will generate all the files required. Oh, actually, no, it asked me if I want to use routing in this app. No, if I want to use CSS or maybe some more advanced styling, boom, all files are generated already. Now it's installed dependencies. 
Again, since you're Java developers, it's similar to what Maven does. You have POM file. In there, you specify all dependencies, similarly over here. So it, it'll finish soon. Done. So the, the project is there. The project is ready. So if I will do, let me see, hello world. I called it hello world, right? If I will do CD hello world, uh, the, the project is there, and I will use uh, Visual Studio Code, the most popular IDE. I was using uh, WebStorm for a while on the front end. Since I was, since I'm accustomed to IntelliJ IDE, the same company, great IDE. But what I hate about that IDE is that indexing. There are tons of files. When you will open it, it starts indexing and indexing and indexing. You wait and wait and wait. I opened, I submitted the issue, but it's a, a year past. I had so many people voted for it, but it doesn't work. So I said, ignore it. So I'll use Visual Studio Code. So that's a project. In this, and in a minute, I'll show you that in React, in Vue, you're going to have something similar to this. And so what is this? Node modules in JavaScript world, in NPM-based projects, has all the dependencies that are installed. SRC is your sources, app module, components, and so on, environments. Uh, for example, app component. They generated this component. Template is technically HTML. And it's an annotation in Angular, add component, think think annotation, they call it decorator in uh, um, TypeScript, and we decorated the class app component. Now, we have, there is a package JSON file which lists all the dependencies. And uh, there is index HTML that will be loaded by the browser. But what I will do, I will do, I will do quickly, I'll open up the terminal window right inside, inside this ID, and I will do npm start. It'll build the bundles now for this app. See, it's building down there. And when it's done, the web server that comes with it will load it on port 4200, localhost 4200. So if I will go to, at the bottom, it shows you that it's on 4200. If I will go somewhere and do localhost 4200, this is an app. App is up and running. It's simple, but it's there. The project is pre-configured. It has all configuration files that you need. It has package JSON, as I said. It has TS config with all compilers, properties, and so on. So all is there. I will kill it. Uh, and let's move on with the slides. Now let's take a look at the React JS library. They also did the same thing. You, they give you this uh, CLI tool, which is called Create React App. React App. Of course, th they did not originally think of TypeScript, but later on they added this uh, option dash dash TypeScript, so they will generate your project with TypeScript. All right, let me come here and let me do Create React App. Hello world. Mm. The directory hello world. Oh, I already have it, sorry. Uh, let me do hello, hello react, for example. Because I already have this one. So now it's create a similar project using react, again, installing dependencies, the structure is the same, components, and so on. So I let it run. Meanwhile, Meanwhile, let me go with the slides a little bit faster. Uh, then uh, Vue.js. In Vue.js, they also created a C CLI tool. It's called Vue. You say Vue create and name of the project, and it'll generate the project similar, similar to what we have. Once again, at this point, it run npm install to pull all dependencies. All right, it's done. The CD, uh, actually. Hello, React, right? Now let me open up the Visual Studio Code for this project. And you'll see it 
you will see that it's very similar, similar structure. Node modules, as usual, all dependencies. Uh, you have uh, SRC, these are the components. The extension TSX means TypeScript with something else. And this something else is called JSX. In React world, they include this special syntax right inside the JavaScript, or in TypeScript for that matter. And it's, this syntax is called JSX. JSX. So they generated the app. This is an app that they generated, CSS. Uh, CSS, what else? Similarly, package JSON uh, with the start command, which is this one, we will, we will do it now. Mm, and TS config, configure TypeScript, so it's very similar. So what I will do now, I don't know what's going on. I want to make it smaller, but it doesn't let me probably because of this projection. Uh, this one is the previous one from, Ang from Angular. Let me close this one. And we'll switch to Hello React. And it doesn't let me, it doesn't let me make it so make it smaller. All right, I'll go, I'll go to the command line then. Uh, I will do npm start from here. Now I'm starting React app. And React app starts on, on the local host 3000. Anyway, they generated the app for me. It's up and running. Similarly, let's do the, let's do the view one, cd, uh, and We'll say view, view, create, create, uh, hello, view. Same thing. It'll uh, it's a, select the options. I will select manually. What do you want to use? I want to use TypeScript. Uh, I don't want to use Bubble, for example. Use. Uh, class style component systems. There are, they have different ways of writing components. I want to write them as classes. Yes. Uh, do you want to use Bubble with TypeScript if you want to use JSX? Uh, all right. Lint on save. So again, it generates the file. I will not be uh, do, doing this again. So you got, the, you got the idea. The structure will be the same and everything. Let's go to the slides. It's not the right slide. It's too soon. It's too soon. Mm, which one is that? This is the one. All right. So we are we are here. So the structure are similar. On the slides you will see I have these three slides that will that you can see them next to each other. Very very similar. Once again, why do I show you all that? I want you to have this attitude that it's not like if I, am, if I work with Angular, I hate React or Vue, and vice versa. It, you need to say, I don't care. You want the next project is in Vue, all right? I'll pick it up. It's the same thing. It's a very similar thing. So we did all that. So I guess we didn't, we didn't start port 8080 yet, but we can, of course. CD hello view. View. NPM in there it's run serve command. Start development server on port 8080. It already started the view app. You know, local host port 8080. Right, so this is an app in view, written in view. If you will open it up, it has the type extension, not TSX or TS, but dot view, all these components. So all these demos are done. Now let's talk about something that, that a typical framework needs, a UI needs. We say that each of these frameworks is component-based. So any UI is a bunch of components. You have uh, 
top-level component, it has children, children may have their own components, and so on. So any app is a tree of components. This is an example of one of the projects I was working on 10 years ago. It was not Angular, it was not React, it was nothing. It was actually Adobe Flex front-end, back-end Java. It was trading app for foreign exchange services. Look at it, it's pretty heavy loaded screen. And traders look at this screen, on the left hand side all is flashing, the data is coming in, they are trading currencies. So, and they have something called currency pair. So for example, over here they say it's euros versus US dollars. Over here it's US dollars versus Japanese yens, and so on. And um, over here, this is a component. These are technically eight components, which are the same but different data for different currencies. So now it means that you, you or someone else needs to create a, comp a component for showing the prices. And the trader looks at it, and there are two buttons, bid and offer. When he likes something to buy, he would click on bid. He likes something to sell, he'll click on offer. But what to do if, if I click on the button bid? This component doesn't know how to place orders to buy or sell something. It just knows how to show things, right? So now we need to uh, create another component, this yellow one, and pass the data, what I want to buy or sell, and at what price. So now we talk about another component. Now we talk about passing data from component A to component B. How to do that? And any of these frameworks, whatever you select, will have this thing for you to figure out. On the right hand side, there are other components, reporting as sales are happening, the data are coming in and so on. So anyway, this is a heavy loaded screen with a bunch of components. And you need to figure out how to pass the data from component A to component B. And we want to do it in a loosely coupled manner. So component A doesn't know about component B, but still they need to be able to send the data back and forth. In Angular, they have these decorators. Actually, it's not in Angular. Decorators are from TypeScript. So TypeScript offers these decorators. In particular, at input, you can have a component, which is a class with a bunch of properties. If you will mark some of the properties with these decorators, for example, at in input, these are like entry doors. Imagine that your component is a black box and it has several entry doors, several input properties. The parent can pass the data to the child through these input properties. Or at output, if you want to send the data out, in some cases the child may need to pass some data to the parent. So in Angular, they, you would declare a property of a certain time with at output, and it can emit events. So it'll fire events and the parent will uh, create a listener and it'll get the event. Uh, so in, this, in this slide you see the example. For example, parent has this tag order processor which represents a component. It's a child component of some other component. And in there we say stock symbol equals stock. Stock is a variable somewhere in the class, but we are binding the value to this property. So now let's take a look at the child. Child is a class, and it has a property stock symbol marked with at input decorator. This is what it makes, this is what makes this property as an input one, and the parent can pass the data to the child through it. In Angular, there are other, way, other ways to arrange data communications. The best one would be uh, having a singleton service, a class, actually an instance of, of the class, and inject it into components that needs to communicate. Angular supports dependency injection, just like Java Spring. Okay, next, in React, the same thing, they also need a mechanism to pass the data from parent to child. So in React.js they have something called props. Props. Props is a way to, for the parent to pass the data to the child component through the props. And how the child can send the data back? Uh, they, in, in React, they use callbacks. I still have props, I can pass the name of the callback function to call, 
And from the child, we, there is a mechanism to invoke a function on the parent, even without knowing who the parent is. Let's take a look at this example. I have a parent component, and there is some piece of code, uh, angle brackets, and in there, weather info. Weather info is a child component. Parent has a child weather info. From this line, I can see that apparently the weather info component has uh, has uh, props called weather, and we can pass, uh, I guess I have an object named weather over here as well. Let's take a look at the child. In the child, uh, this is how the child component may look like in React. As a matter of fact, React supports different syntaxes. It, it can, you can create component as a class, or you can create component as a function. Functions are easier to create. In this case, as you can see, I declared a, a variable of type react.fc, functional component. And this is a syntax. Uh, it's like lambda in JavaScript, passing parameter to the function. So the function in there is this function can return the HTML, the, the UI. But in here, as, as, as you can see, I have the props, weather. So some weather object will jump right inside the props. And uh, I can take this object. And JavaScript has a syntax called um, destructuring. So it'll extract the value of weather, uh, of, of sort of city and temp, into these separate variables. And I can show them on the screen. Curly braces means binding. Props. By looking at a line like this, you, are, you understand right away that child component has prompts weather. Vue.js, similarly, actually, I didn't say, didn't say one thing. On the way back, if a child needs to, to pass some data to the parent, uh, they use callbacks. So in the child, you may have a function. And, you, uh, and in the parent, you have a function. And you map them. And you pass them through the problems. So child will say, they gave me a name of what to call if I need to send something to the parent. Child doesn't know who is the parent. Child doesn't have this function. But the parent has a mapping. What, child, what name the child knows is mapped to a function that parent has. So this is how it works there. In view, they also use the concept of props. So parents passes data down, down to the, down to the child. And uh, on the way back, the child can emit events, similarly to Angular. So in this example, let's see, we have a parent. In view, there is a section called template. Everywhere, when they say template, you mean, they mean UI, some markup. In a simple case, it's HTML. So the parent has, in the, in the template, it has angle bracket hello world, meaning it has a child, apparently hello world, and MSG is equal Hello from the parent. This MSG tells me that it's a props. So we are passing hello world down to the component. The child in view may look like this. Expert default class hello world extends view. And the variable MSG is marked with at prop decorator. Or again, in Java, lingua with annotation. Exclamation point over here means Ignore nulls. If there is null, maybe the component is not ready yet. Don't give me these er, null pointer exceptions. So, these, so as you see, each framework has, has means for data exchange between components. Next important thing that you need to think about as a front-end developer is application state management. Super important thing. And later, I'll, I'll give you an example when uh, poor state management can give you, can give you troubles. So there's, there's a whole bunch of components. This is your front end. 
And these components may rely on some state, which should be outside of the component. Component A may put something in that state object. Component B may need to get something from that object. At any given time, it's like a state machine. Your app is in some state. So where is that state stored? How to arrange that in different framework? And in Angular, there is an internal mechanism, very easy to implement. It's called, I mean, it has dependency injection, so you can create a singleton object. You can inject it into component A, inject the same instant into component B. This way, component A can put something in there, and they also have a mechanism of pushing data, subscriptions, similar to messaging, uh, the library called RxJS. So you, component B can subscribe to changes, component A can put something in the state. Very simple. But nobody likes things when they are simple, so they created a library called NGRX. Uh, it's, uh, if somebody is working with Angular, you can find I recorded a video like for 25 minutes on YouTube uh, when NJRX is overkill. I explain why. But for now, let's, let's not worry about it. How this library came about? How it came about? In React.js, in React world, by the way, React is backed by Facebook. This is a product of Facebook. Angular is a product of a team that works in Google. Vue is not backed by any large company, but it has a bunch of contributors. Anyway, React was first in this regard to create this library called Redux. I'll explain you in a minute what it is, specifically for state management. And Vue.js also has it. They have a library called Vuex to implement state management. As I said, it came from Facebook. It came from Facebook community. Why? There was that infamous bug. And I am sure in many other apps you, you've seen this. Look at this thing. You have a little icon saying that you have so many messages, right? Maybe text messages or something. How many times you see this one, you click on it, you open up the next screen to see the messages, but there's nothing there. Or maybe not one, but five. Mismatch, right? Everybody experiences this, right? So this is when Facebook app ran into this problem. They started to see that the state, and this is basically an example of a state, counter for the messages. They used to work with MVC architecture, model view controller, and the state, the number of messages, was stored in multiple places. So to synchronize how many actually messages you have, uh, it wouldn't be easy. And they decided, we are not going to go this route. Let's change completely the way we manage state. And they came up with this architecture called Flux. The whole idea is that we need to have a single source of truth. Meaning what? Meaning that if there is a counter of messages somewhere, there, is, there should be only one place where the number is stored. In that case, each and every component would go to that place, and we wouldn't have different numbers as to how many messages are there. So they came, uh, they came up with this idea. There is an action, maybe an event. User clicked, actually, actually from here, this is a view. User may click on the button. They would dispatch an action. Instead of trying to increment counter right there, they will in dispatch an action. One new, add one more message, or add one to counter. Then dispatcher would work with something called store. Store is a single source of truth. Everything that you think represents state of your app is sitting inside that store. So none of the view, you may have 10 different views, 10 different components, none of them would directly manipulate the state. They would dispatch an event. Everything is happening in the store, and then they can subscribe 
from the store to see the current value of counter in this case. And any app is a bunch of components, like it's a tree of components, grandparent, child, grandchild, and so on. They may have some input and output properties and so on, but this state is moved away from that tree. So any of these components would go and ask the store, tell me the, how many messages I have, and so on. And based on that architecture, Facebook created a library. And that library is called Redux. So Flux is an architecture. Redux is implementation of that architecture. So let's take a look. Let's say I have a view like this. I have a lemon and I have a button buy three. Say I want to buy three lemons. And when I do this, I want to display the result. And somewhere the state should change. So now I have uh, less lemons. So what would, we, what would I do if I work with Redux? Click on the button, would not change the counter of lemons. It would dispatch an action. In this case, we have a store, global store somewhere. We say on the store, dispatch an action. Which action? Buy lemons. And the action may have so-called payload. Payload would be three in this case. I want to, as the action is buy lemon, how many? Three. So the action would go to the store, and in, in the store they have a function called reducer. They, have, they may have more than one, but the point is, it'll take the action as an argument, and the second argument is a current state. Inside that reducer, which treats store as immutable, it will not change it. It will change the state. It will create a new state. It will clone it. In the clone, it will update the counter of lemons, and it will return a new state. Then, again, component subscribes to these changes and shows that we bought three lemons. The main takeaway from this slide is that we have one and only single source of truth. Only this guy knows everything about the lemons. No matter if you'll create another view component and another component, they will all come here. And again, in Redux, the thing reducer is immutable. Next important thing when you work with these libraries. By the way, I didn't mention. Since I was telling about immutability, I put it as a note down there. If you work with Vue, they have a library called Vuex. It works similarly to this. The only thing is that they mutate the state over here directly. All right. Next thing that you need to, to know, no matter which of these libraries you use, is how do you deal with component lifecycle? Any view component goes through a, set of, through a set of steps in its life. Important events are happening in the life of a component. In some cases, you want to write pieces of code when some event happens. For example, the framework creates an instance of some component, and you want to make a request to the server to get some data to populate the UI. When do you want to do this? How do you know that moment when the component is ready and it's already rendered in the browser? So Angular offers you a whole bunch of methods. They are so-called uh, callbacks or hooks, lifecycle hooks, meaning you are not going to be writing code directly invoking these methods. The framework will invoke it for you. Your role is, for example, in this case, ng on init. We know from documentation on Angular that ng on init is invoked when the component is ready. So you know all the code, all the HTTP GET requests, for example, you would put in this method, ng on init. ng on destroy is invoked when component is about to be destroyed and removed from the UI, removed from the DOM. So you have these places. If you don't want to use any of them, fine. 
But if you want to make sure that your code is invoked at a certain place, certain time, you use these callbacks. Next, React.js, they also have callbacks. And uh, since React has allows you to write components in two different ways, class-based components or function-based components, they have different things. For class-based components, they also have hooks, lifecycle, and they don't call them hooks, but they are callbacks. Lifecycle callbacks. Again, the idea is similar. For example, component did mount. This is when component is ready. If you decide to create components in React using uh, functional components, you will have different hooks. Next, in Vue.js, same thing. You have a component, they give you all these callbacks. Before create, created, before destroy, destroyed, and so on. So the, you, got, you got the idea. Three frameworks, the same thing. Next important thing no matter which framework you will pick. Once again, my goal is not to tell you that framework A or B or C is the best. No. My goal is to explain you, or actually to convince you that you are a professional and you will work with any of these. You will not be fighting with anybody. As a matter of fact, let me explain you, let me tell you the story. Two years ago, I was working on a project Mercedes-Benz, no, but not for the car, for the vans, vans. And uh, they had this app, excellent app, and the company is great as well. I didn't know that they have 1,700 different configuration options when you buy a van. You cannot imagine what do they do. I mean. It looks like a van. You want it to be higher, fine. You want it to be wider, fine. You want it to be for a handyman, they will give you the whole bunch of shelves inside. You want it to be for passengers, fine. 1,700 different options. And the, their website is written in different frameworks. It was jQuery, it was Angular, it was React, different module. And when the customer goes step by step trying to buy a van or configure, configure a van, there is one module that allows you one set of configuration and the other module which allows you to continue. And the goal was to bring them together. So if I started to select major options like uh, height, for example, and then I want to configure it inside. I had to move from one module to the other in the code. And since they were written in different frameworks, the state manager was uh, organized differently. I'm not saying that they did something wrong, but I'm saying to you, if you will start working on a new app on the front end, you need to think about state management first. Because later on, it's more expensive to add new features if different pieces are um, written using different methodologies. So no matter what framework you will pick for your next project, what, the only advice I can give you, don't mix them. I've seen cases, the whole, I mean, half of the app is written in Angular. All of a sudden, I see a module that is written in React. I ask them, why? You know what, we had a consultant, and he likes React, and he says that React is better. So they implemented the, that module in React. I'm not saying anything against React, but the consultant is gone. And now you have two frameworks. Now you need to hire people who understand Angular, who understand React. Now you need to think how to exchange data between components, different frameworks, different concepts, how to arrange state management, and so on. Don't mix. All right, so change detection. What is change detection? There is UI, component. When your code's supposed to refresh the UI, let's say you make a request to the server, HTTP GET, and you have some REST server written in Java, for example. Asynchronous request, the whole Java world is asynchronous. When, how do you know that it's time to refresh the data on the screen? How do you know that the data came back from the server? And in different, so this is what we call change detection to detect the moment 
when the UI should be updated. So, in Angular, it's done automatically. In Angular, there is something, they use internal library called zone.js. It's sitting in the memory, it's hanging and monitoring everything asynchronous. You click on the button, it's asynchronous request. You invoke set timer or set interval, it's asynchronous request. You make HTTP GET, it's asynchronous. So that library is monitoring and seeing when this asynchronous piece is finished. And after that, it'll signal that it's time to, uh, to check what has to be updated. And uh, change detection store, change detector starts traversing the whole tree of components from top to bottom to see which child should be updated. And it'll update, refresh, refresh, refresh. So it's done automatically. There are some ways to fine tune it, but in any way. Anyway, so it's there. In React.js, it's differently. In React.js, you have to manually do something. They have this idea about internal state of the component, not application state, but component state. And they say, if you want, whenever you change the variable that was assigned as a state, it automatically refreshes the UI. It re-renders the UI as the minute you change the state. So in that regard, you have to do this manually. It's not done like in Angular. I'm not saying it's bad or something, but it's different. In Vue.js, similar to React, in Vue.js they have this concept of data object, specific variable data. And if you declare a data object and inside you have some properties, you declare them. These properties are considered as um, kind of component state. And if you will change any of these properties in your program, it'll signal to view that it's time to refresh the UI. If you will change some other properties that are not the part of the data, then it won't change the UI. This is how it's done in this library. So it's different, but uh, this is something to think about. Next, URL, routing, client-side navigation. Look at this URL. So what do, we ha what do we see there? I have HTTP, mysite.com, and a port, and then a hash sign, and then something else. So up till the port, this is all information about the server. This is where you deployed your app on that port. If I will change any of these letters, it'll result in a request to the server, right? Because I changed that domain name or maybe the port. But if you have a hash sign and something else after it, this something else is so-called named anchor in HTML, and your browser will try to find this location within the code that is already loaded. So it will not make a request to the server. Uh, five years ago, when HTML5 was introduced, they came up with something called History API. So you don't have to uh, use this hash sign in the URL. I will not go there, but there is a way without it. But we need to have a way for client-side navigation. When the, all these modern apps are single-page app. So it's like, for example, uh, Google Mail, Gmail client for the web. You have a feeling that you work with an app. Why? Because the page doesn't refresh the entire page. Part of it may. For example, you have an input box. You see messages. If the new message comes in, the browser doesn't refresh the entire page, right? All of a sudden, you see one extra line over here with a new message, and so on. So that's a big idea of um, uh, single-page apps. And if you want to arrange users' navigation on the UI without making requests to the server, the code is already here. And I want to, when the user shows the product list and clicks on the product, we want to see next to it product details, right? So it could be a component within the page. That component may be shown up, the data is given to them, and so on. All this is done using so-called router. Routers are for client-side navigation. In the router, you are mapping a fragment on the client. For example, product page slash three. Three maybe it's a page number. To the component that should be rendered. And in Angular, router is included already. 
It's, it's a part of the framework. It defined how to, how to map the fragment of the URL to the component that should be shown on the, within the page. Very powerful router, and uh, I will not again going, be going to detail, but it's there. In React.js, there are options. So there is uh, React router, there are some other libraries. If you go to this link, you will see several ways of managing uh, routes or client-side navigation with React. Once again, I'll repeat, React.js was created as, a, as an excellent actual library for rendering UI. Routing is like an extra. In Vue.js, they, they in include their own router as well. So it's not only core library, but the router is a part of the, of the view. So to sum it up, once again, the main takeaway from this portion of the app, you need to update your resume. And you need to add there Angular, React, and Vue. And if you will ask me if there is any one thing that makes them better or worse fit to any, any situation, I would say this. Angular is a better fit if you want to rewrite the whole app, make it the single page app completely controlled by Angular. If, if completely controlled by your framework, so to speak. If that's the case, if you're starting a new project or you're replacing an existing project, Angular is great. Everything there, all tooling you can think of, including UI, which I didn't even touch, UI components. But in the real life, you may be in a situation that nobody will let you rewriting the entire web app. They can tell you, this new module, we want to add a new menu up on top. When the user will click on it, we want to display something. And this something should be done in Angular. That's not great. I mean, there are ways to do this, but I would not recommend to use Angular in this case. Whereas React or Vue, easy. You can take any HTML, existing HTML, div is in there. Give it an ID. ID is equal DevOps. And then you can say React or View. You can say React. You're going to be managing just this div. Everything that is inside is yours. The rest is none of your business. The same with View. So if you cannot rewrite the whole web, uh, the whole web app, if you want to work with only a small portion of it, then use React or use View. Whatever you like better. And finally, I want to show you three versions of the app. Again, it's all, it's all this in that book, TypeScript quickly. And I want to show you this sample blockchain app written when the client is written in Angular. Another version, the client is written in React. And the third one, the client is written in Vue. But before even showing you all that, I need to give you an idea what is this what this blockchain is about. Last year, I had the entire presentation about blockchain, but this time I'll use a couple of slides from there, but we spend more time on the code in this case. So if somebody already listened to this part, I'm sorry, I have to repeat myself a little. So what is this for, in general, this uh, blockchain thing? It's about, the, it's about the trust problem, how to solve it when you have two party or three party, and there are some transactions. For example, I want to pay Mary $1,000. Did I pay? Did she receive? She says, I didn't receive. I say, I, I did pay. So how, do, how to solve this trust problem? Typically, you have somewhere in the middle, like a bank, for example. A bank would be a central authority for our transaction. I would go to my bank account online, and I would say, transfer money to Mary in that bank, and this is her account. Then this bank would spend some time, there is a special process, clearing process, and Mary would get the money on the account. 
So now I don't have to trust Mary, and Mary can say whatever she wants. We have a central authority, the bank, which says, yes, I did transfer the money. If the bank server is down, tough luck. We need to wait until the, it's up. So that's the, the thing. And the blockchain is a technology that helps to eliminate this central authority, this middleman. And it offers a way to have this ledger. Ledger is like a I mean, book of records. It could be a bank, it could be anything that is maintained by, by multiple parties without the central authority. Like in my example, I have the whole database, Mary has the whole database, and someone else has the whole database, and they are the same, and they are trusted. That's the whole idea of blockchain. Originally, it was, the whole idea was introduced in 1991, but it was not being used massively until in 2008, somebody or something called Satoshi Nakamoto, till now nobody knows if this is a person or if it's a group of people or what, what it is. So uh, they published a paper explaining how to use blockchain for sending money without central authority. And this is how Bitcoin was created. So under the hood, Bitcoin is using blockchain technology. And they, uh, they explained how to use cryptography, and that's why we call them cryptocurrencies, all these, right? So, in any blockchain-based app, it doesn't have to be bitcoins. It could be, for example, travel agencies. They all are booking seats for your next flight. As of now, there is a central place, right? Central authority. All of them go to the same server, and they rely on it. But uh, again, this technology allows you to eliminate this central server. So block, so each node in this chain knows everything about all, all the data in the chain. And they, these data are blocks. These blocks are linked to each other. Blocks are linked. This is an example of a block of a, sorry, of a typical or traditional app which is not using blockchain. It's using a central authority, like a bank, for example. This is a bank. Or this is a, a server that knows all the seats in the airline, and so on. Decentralized processing allows you to eliminate it. So again, let's say this is a travel agency, this is another travel agency. These circles are computers, they have more or less, but each of them has the latest information and trustworthy information about the tickets, about the seat availability. So it's decentralized immutable ledger represented by a collection of blocks. And each block can store any type of data. In this example, this is the very first block. At some point, any blockchain started. And this such a block is called Genesis block. But the point is that each block has some business-related information. For example, uh, date, May, thir May 3, 1305, Joe paid Mary $20. Or maybe several transactions like this. But they are linked. They are linked by hash code. See this? Each block has, a ref has its own hash code and a reference to the hash code of the previous block. See, it starts with E3B0. This is also E3B0, reference to the previous hash code. If a new block will be created, they will have their own transaction plus the reference to the previous block hash code, and they will generate a new one. Hash code is generated based on the content of this block. In a simple uh, case, think of it this way. They will concatenate everything. 3, main, 3, 18, 10, Alex, paid, Lou, 55, in one long string. And they will run it through a special function to produce hash code, which is unique. And based on the content, this code will be unique. And uh, this is how they will create a block. They can, they can generate a new code 
they can link it to the previous code and submit it to the blockchain for insertion. The question is, we have thousands of nodes. Everybody wants to insert, want to prepare the block. Why? They are rewarded. In Bitcoin, for example, what they call Bitcoin mining, people are rewarded for calculating the hash. You can say, what's the big deal? You can calculate hash in a second. Yes, if, you, if this hash has not, no, not any specific requirement. In Bitcoin, they have. Imagine that not only I want to generate a hash code, but I want it to start from 20 zeros. This task immediately becomes so time-consuming and resource-consuming. Just generate any hash code is easy, but generate a hash code with meet specific criteria is difficult. So in, in the Bitcoin world, all these nodes are trying to find the hash which starts with 20 zeros, for example, and say, I found it. Am I the first? I don't know, because many other nodes were trying to find it. So they spent tons of resources, money, and so on, will not go there. But there is a special method called consensus. And in that method, uh, there is a way to figure, out, to figure out who was the first guy. Who is the guy who should be rewarded? Uh, that's the consensus. So, and when, let's say I am the winner, so my block will be added to the blockchain, everybody else in the chain will be notified, and their chain will be updated with my block. So this is what's going to happen. And all block data is immutable, you cannot change it. Why you cannot change it? Actually, let me just show you uh, just a, a second about this hashing function. So I'll take this. My computer has it. Windows computer has it. There are online utilities to generate hash of anything. You enter a string, you can enter the, the whole book. And if you use a specific hash, in particular SHA-256, it's a special algorithm. It'll produce you a line like this that consists of 64 characters, and it's unique. Let me show you. Let me kill that. See? Oh, you, why don't see that? I don't know, guys. What, I don't know what happens. For some reason, it doesn't show me. It doesn't show you that thing. For some reason, this monitor can show you only the presentation, only the slides. I don't know what's going on over there. I can actually kill it. I cannot even kill it. Maybe I can. Let me, let me kill the presentation. Uh, force quit. I will f quit Keynote. I don't get it. I killed it already. I don't know whose screen is it, guys. It doesn't show me. It's not my screen. It shows the former image. I don't have this on the screen or anywhere else. So maybe we'll refresh it. No, it's not my screen. See, my presentation was hacked. So you are watching somebody else's presentation. See, they didn't use blockchain. That's why they are messing around. See, now we are talking. This is mine. All right, so let me go here then. Yeah, so. No, it doesn't let me work on my, with my keyboard now. Oh, now it does. All right, let me do this. Uh, see this command line? I'm, I want to generate hash. 
it generated for me uh, this number. If I will change anything a little bit, instead of hello world, I will add one, two, three, for example. The hash will be different. Just look at the first letters. See, it's different. So you touched it, it's different hash, hash code. So the whole idea is that the whole idea is that if somebody will try to mess around with a block, it'll generate a new hash code. And, and uh, so what about, uh, so what, what's so good about it? It means that if somebody will try to modify it, the whole chain will be broken because every block relies on the hash code of the previous one. Let's say we have 25 blocks. Technically, they, they have thousands, but let's say 25. If I will try to modify block number eight and save it, for example, I said that I send Mary $1,000 from my account. What stops me from trying to, I only have $1,000. What stops me from creating and from updating this transaction saying that I actually paid her $5,000? Block is immutable. The minute I'll try to do this, a new hash code will be generated and the whole chain will be broken because my new hash code will be different. The next block relies on some hash code that was correct. Now it's different. So this block will never be inserted in there. Now, in this example I sh that I show you, my hash code was not, uh, was not starting with any speci specific numbers in the beginning. But what they do, in particular in Bitcoin or somewhere else as well, they want you, you meaning the owner of the node, to work hard. So it will not be that easy to create a, a block and add it to the chain. And you, they want you to compete. Because of that, they create algorithms, uh, for example, in Bitcoin, that it takes 10 minutes, roughly, and tremendous amount of power. We are not talking about one computer. I mean, farms of computer. It takes them 10 minutes to find the hash that starts with 20 zeros, for example. And if somebody finds it, it's, it is considered as proof of work. And you found it, and she found it, and we will f use consensus algorithm to find who is the winner. So, in this example, it doesn't start with anything. But let's start. We want to create an algorithm that will always generate a hash code that starts with four zeros. It's pretty fast. And for that, there is, some, there is a concept called nonce, number once, a number that can be used only once. So if I will add, so let's say you have um, some text like I did, like I hear, June 4, 1530, Simon refunded L200. If, if I generate, if I will run this hash code generation in a loop, trying to add, first I will attach one, two, three, and for every one I will generate a new hash code. At some point, it'll generate hash code that starts with four zeros. Sooner or later, right? And this number that you will find by running this loop and keep in incrementing it, it's called nonce. So the first guy who will find it, this is the guy who solves the problem. So in this case, in this particular case, like, look at this. I found it uh, uh, as 236499. Let's do this. Two, three, two, three, six. Two, three, six, four, nine, nine. No, something is wrong. Mm, two, three, six, four, nine, nine. Two. Oh, string is not the same. All right, agree. So in this case, let's do this. I will take this string. So this is, see, with this code, with this code, it starts with four zeros. Now let me remove this line. So my, my keyboard doesn't work properly, guys. I cannot delete 
Oh, I can. Now I can. See, this hash code doesn't start with four zeros. But with this extra number, it does. So now imagine if I would have a requirement to generate hash codes that start with 20 zeros. It will take months and months and months on my computer. The, the task becomes much more difficult. So anyway, the whole idea is to generate code. And as you can see, since it's immutable, nobody can mess around. And there are different applications for this blockchain technology. For example, voting system. If, if voting system would be implemented using blockchain, you, nobody could uh, modify the voting of me or you or anybody. Because the minute they do this new hash code, it will not validate and so on. All right, so and finally, finally, I'll show you quickly these three apps that uh, have the client. Uh, and in this particular case, I use server. But I, I don't use server to store data. I use messaging server, uh, which is implemented using WebSocket technology, just to send messages to the node. For example, I am the one who finished calculation, or maybe you are the one, and so on. Only messaging part is done with WebLogic server. Technically, even this part could be removed, so there's no server. There are technology of peer-to-peer -peer communication without servers. One of the popular ones is called WebRTC. And WebRTC would allow me to eliminate this messaging server and uh, all these web sockets all together. If you will decide to try it out, you can go to, you can go to GitHub. Uh, GitHub, you have it in the slides. And you can download the entire code. In particular, I will show you examples from chapter 12, which is Angular version of Bitcoin, chapter, thir chapter 14, which is a React version of Bitcoin, and chapter 16 is the blockchain version, sorry, the view version of blockchain. So each of them has code of server and client, but in this case, I will reuse the server because it's the same, basically. The UI will look like this. In this UI, I can add transactions, like Joe paid Mary and this amount. Then I will say add transactions. I will add some number of transactions, one, two, three, four. And then I will click on the button, generate block. At this point, it will start generating the block and hash code. And it will generate the one that starts with four zeros. Then I also, under, under the hood, for the book, we use this messaging server to announce that I am ready. So a new block is there, insert it. I will not be going into those algorithms. But the, in each of these frameworks, we'll have similar architecture. We will, be, we will be using CLI to generate a project with their own local dev server. In this particular case, we will run dev server that runs our, that store our app, our app UI on port 4200, but the WebSocket server, the messaging one, will be running on port 3000. Angular is in the browser. In the second version, we have React app, which will be served by dev server from port 3001, but the web server will still run on port 3000. And the third version, again, the same architecture, but the CLI will run on port 8080, sorry, web server, dev web server for view and the data will be coming from WebSocket server. How to run it? If you will decide to download the source code from that uh, place, from GitHub, uh, there are two folders in each of these chapters. One of them is called server, and the other one is called client. You need to have a, a node installed, and if, if you have it, then you will do npm install from the server directory, and then you'll do npm start. It'll start the server. The server will be listening on port 3000. To start the client, in case of view, you will go to client directory, you will run npm install, npm run serve. For React, uh, npm start, and for Angular, npm start. So let's, let's do this. Uh, let's do this. I will start these, these apps now. So right now, I have this. Uh, I have this directory. I called it Ukraine, uh, but again, you can get the code from the you can get the code from the GitHub. 
So I'll go to this directory. No. Name starts with Ukraine. It's over here. I have this black, uh, uh, blockchain Angular, blockchain React, blockchain View. Chapter 12, chapter 14, chapter 16. Let's come here and um, there is a client and there is a server. I'll go to the server directory. I'll do the, I will not be opening ID. I will just go to the terminal. Uh, where am I? See, I'm the directory uh, server. And I will do npm start. I didn't do an npm install because I already installed all dependencies. npm starts. So it started the server, the messaging server with web sockets on uh, the port 3000. I leave it alone, let it stay. Now I will go to the folder client. Right click, new terminal in the folder client, right? So once again, I didn't mean so, I will do npm start. Start. As a matter of fact, let me open the code. Uh, code in the IDE. I am in the IDE, in the Visual Studio code, and what I will do, what I will do, I will, I, I'll show you the code, and I will, I have this terminal over here, in this panel, so I will do npm start from here. So it'll build the bundles and load the app, and the dev server will start on port 4200. This is done, so I'll go uh, to port 4200. Let me refresh it. And now it shows me this blockchain app. So it has uh, several components. All these are child components. This one is transaction form. Mary, send Yaakov, $100. Add transaction. Component communications. Component A sends the data up, and it went to the component B, which is transaction. Let's do this. Petro, send to whom? To Yaakov. $3,000 this time. That. So now we have two transactions, right? Let's say I want to generate a block for these uh, two transactions. I click on the button Generate Block. It starts calculating for four zeros uh, hash code. When it's done, it's done. So now my blockchain has a Genesis block, the very first one, and the next one, and so on. So if you'll take a really quick look at the code, at the code. This is Angular version of the app, and it has, it has a shared directory. This shared directory has library, little small scripts to generate, to generate the blockchain. See, for example, all is written in TypeScript, so you can, again, if you want, if you will get a book, then you can read the book. Uh, and it's, uh, each app is de described in there. In this case here, I have this hash code requirement uh, for zeros. And um, mine block is trying to find this hash. See, I have this loop do while. I, I try to find the block with the start with four zeros. And I will keep running, running, running until I find it. There is some other code as well. Crypto service is a little library. Uh, every browser has it, by the way, to generate uh, hash with the algorithm SHA-256 and so on. Now, the, uh, so that is the shared directory. In each of the versions of this app, Angular, Vue, React, this part is the same. I mean, the algorithms are the same. The UI could, will be different. Inside the app, I have an app component, which has app component HTML. UI is over here. That's the UI that you just saw. Transactions, pending transactions, and so on. It has, this is a form. On, up on top, where I was entering uh, sender, recipient, and amount, right? In the middle, we have these pending transactions, and there is a button, generate block. Uh, once again, I'm not going to go through the code, but if you want, uh, you, you can go and try it. Then I will hit Control C. I will keep that server running, and now this time, what I will do, 
I will go to a different directory. This directory, the second one is called BC React. Same idea, blockchain, it has a client as a server. I already have the server running, so I will uh, go to the client. Now I'm going to the React app. New terminal and folder. Am I there? Yes. So code, I'm going to Visual Studio Code. This time it's a React version of the app. You will see something very similar. Components, UI part is sitting over here in the components directory. Over here we call it lib. In the lib you see, again, WebSocket controller, which is, uh, which is implementing these four zeros. Uh, cryptography that generates code and some blockchain node. Sorry, this guy is implementing. WebSocket controller is communicating with the server. And the components, once again, app, the top level component, uh, block panel at the bottom with the blocks, pending transaction in the middle, in transaction form, sender, recipient, amount. Same thing. So if I, am, if I will do npm start, no, actually it's React, right? Yeah, it's React. npm start, it'll run it on port uh, 3001, I think, in my case. As you can see, that messaging server was up and running, so it remembers that Mary sent me $100 and Petro sent me $3,000, right? So I can keep, this is different client, this is client in React. So, uh, who is this? Anna, sent to whom? Yakov. Not, not much, $345. Generate block, it'll generate another block, and so on. You will see it at the bottom in a couple of seconds. Yeah, it's there. All the, all the code is working properly with all these caches. Fine, let's do this. Finally, I will kill this one, Control C. I don't need this app anymore. I will go back and I will run the third version of this client, directory BC view. Again, blockchain client. I will go to the client. Client, open the Visual Studio code in that directory. And this is a view version of the code. View version of the code. Same idea, look at this, lib. The same files, right, same files. Once again, for zero and so on. UI is in directory component, but they have extension view, block, and this and that and so on. If you will run this code, uh, for view you need to do npm run serve, or you can actually define a command npm start as well. It'll start it on port 8080. Yeah, it's running on port 8080, so I can go to port 8080 now. So this will be the This is a client from view. Same thing. I am not going to waste your time, but this works. So my main message is: don't worry that much about which frame to uh, which framework to use. Just use it. But I can really, really recommend you using TypeScript. It's a very productive way of writing uh, writing JavaScript. That's about it. Oh yeah, these are the, this is my Twitter handle, my blog. Mm. I met uh, Kay Horseman. I respect this guy. I bought his book on Java like 15 years ago, the first one. And when I uh, said who I am, he said, you are so productive, you publish so much technical content on the internet. In that blog I published like more than 1,000 blogs. And I recently started on YouTube a bunch of videos on career in IT. It's in Russian, so if you care, uh, check it out. That's all. Thank you very much, and if you have questions, I'll answer them. Yep. And for, for this lady, I will give the T-shirt. That's for you. On the back, you have a discount code for 50%, so you will never forget. And this is for you. All right. Questions? Who 
Oh, for UI, I, I can tell you, as of now, the most popular was and probably will remain Bootstrap. People keep using it. It has a small number of components that looks decent. And the, the most probably important thing in Bootstrap is that they, use, they support uh, responsive web design. So you can write one code, different CSS, and on small and large devices, it'll adjust itself. But we use... In our company, we use Angular, and Angular comes with the library called Angular Material. The thing is that there is a big movement to create standardized UI. As of today, there is some understanding as to what looks good. C colors matching and how the components look, how they react. You touch it, you click on it, it should make a movement and so on. And big companies such as uh, Google, Apple, they started creating the standards for designing UI. These standards are not for developers to read, but they are for designers and for creators of UI libraries. And Angular Material is, goes by the spec published by Google called Material Design. Excellent looking components. UI looks really nice. If you work with Angular, I definitely suggest using Angular Material. The thing is that it may not be enough for you. It may not have all the components that you need. It has like maybe 40 components as of now. For that, what, what we did, we took it as a base and we added another library. In that case, it was either Bootstrap or PrimeNG, I don't remember. And, um, but the, as soon as new UI components from Angular Material will be released, we are removing it, the, the other one. We are using also for grids. We use ag-grid component, ag-grid. You have to, I mean, they have a free version, but the professional one is you have to buy. Any enterprise, serious enterprise app needs a grid, T a table, rows and columns. So the best one is ag-grid, so we use ag-grid component for grids. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. OK. Oh, OK. So the question was, I didn't tell anything about unit tests. See, a decent person. If I knew that this, you would ask this question before, I would give you a t-shirt. Because nobody wants to run testing, right? Nobody wants to run unit tests. So there are unit tests and there are end-to-end -end tests. Unit test is testing a small unit of work. And since I am the person who works mainly in Angular, uh, we use the library called Jasmine. It comes with the Angular, it's packaged already, it's pre-configured. Uh, you don't have to use specifically, uh, specifically Jasmine. There is Jasmine, there is Mocha, but one of these you use. But unit tests test only a small portion of the code. To run unit test, we use the runner called Karma. Karma. This is a unit test runner that can run from the command line, and you can embed it to, the, to your deployment workflow. So it automatically runs. If it fails, your, the whole build fails. Moreover, the, they have, the Karma runner has additional plugins. One of them is called Istanbul. That thing can enforce, can enforce code coverage. You can specify criteria that 80% of the code must be covered with unit test, and you do this. For end-to-end uh, -end tests, this is an, uh, it's not a, a small unit of work anymore. It's emulation of user's actions. So for example, login process. The user needs to enter ID, enter the password, click on the button. Request should go to the authentication server. The response can come back with success or failure. So all that can be scripted. So it runs automatically without using, touching anything. And for that, many people still, many people still use uh, the library based on the Selenium server. 
In particular, in the Angular world, we use Protractor, but under the hood, it uses Selenium API to control the browser, to run the scripts, and so on. Uh, the, the better library I recommend you to look at, it's called Cypress. Cypress. Uh, that's library is, that library is not relying on a Selenium server, but it also can script the tests. Other questions? Excuse me? Is JavaScript immortal? I think yes. And the reason is nobody has the money for funeral. To bury JavaScript is very expensive. Because literally half of the software is written in JavaScript. So regardless, you like it, you don't like it, you can fight against everybody. And next time you are invited to birthday party, you can, you can start arguing. But it is what it is. Like I remember back in the, like 15 years ago, people said, mainframe, COBOL, they will be gone. No, they won't be gone. Do you have money to rewrite the app that works fine? It is written in COBOL. Why? Just because there is more fashionable or popular language these days? No. So JavaScript will remain number one for a while, for many years to come. All right, thank you very much for coming. <laughs>